we need to use. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can uh, This is Nick Bannon still. Uh, just checking first here to see if anyone or if everyone can hear me. Okay. Loud and clear. Okay, very good. Uh, so we are uh, straight up at 12. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and try to kick this thing off here. Um, thank you for everyone that's on the call and, and for joining us this afternoon. Um, Gail, I'm going to turn it over to you here. Uh, in an effort to try to streamline this, I think it's easiest if you want to uh, read down the roster and, and kind of do a roll call instead of letting it free for all with people jumping on. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll start the top. Um, Dr. Alexander. Okay. Gerard Grimaldi. Good afternoon. Robert Nodell. I'm here, thank you. Caitlin Lambert. Present. Uh, Brick McCandless. Here. Okay. Um, Representative Tracy McCurry. Here. Okay. Um, Sarah Order. Okay. Uh, David Ott. Representative John Patterson. You'll be in camera. This is fine with me. Nick Fanestell. <clears throat> yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, Joe Hurley. Here. Okay, um, I believe Gareth Davis is on for um, Senator Raider. Correct. Okay. Um, Mark Sanford. Senator Jill Shoup. Here. Okay. Mark Stringer. Okay. And Jennifer Titball. Here. Okay. That's everybody on, on the on the list. So I'll get, I'll record the other ones later. 
Gail, or if I missed Donna anybody. Oh, Gail, you have Donna Siebenick here from Mark Stringer. Donna Siebenick from Mark Stringer. Oh, okay. Thank you, Donna. Okay, very good. Thank you, Gail. Um, so first off, I'll, I'll start with uh, housekeeping items, kind of like always. Um, again, I appreciate everybody uh, getting on to the meeting today, but via technology, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult. So uh, for those of you in attendance, please uh, remember to mute yourself um, unless you are speaking. So that way we can try to minimize any feedback or interruptions. Um, please, if you do have questions, uh, please remember to unmute yourself so that way we can definitely hear you. Um, another feature would be the chat uh, option. I do have that box up on my computer. So if there, are, if there are any questions and you're not quite sure of where to jump in, if you do uh, type your question out in the chat box, I will uh, be monitoring that and make sure that we try to get over to you for the question. Um, and then uh, other than that, um, I will be keeping a, an eye on the agenda to try to move us along. So if I need to jump in, uh, excuse me, um, I'll apologize now, but I will try to jump in and, and keep us moving along. OK. Um, so secondly, for each meeting, uh, the first first item that we always have to do after the roll call is is for a review of the prior meetings of minutes. So uh, all committee members should have received the prior meetings committed uh, from Gail in an email earlier this week. Uh, that was the February 4th meeting minutes. So at this time, I'll, I'll give a minute uh, here or a few seconds for uh, everyone to review that. And if there's uh, any questions or concerns, please bring those forth. And once everyone has an opportunity to kind of review those, if, if there are no recommendations or changes, then I'll entertain a motion for approval of those February 4th minutes. This is Sam Alexander. I move for approving those. Okay, I have a first. Uh, uh, do I hear a second for approval of the February 4th minutes? This is Kaylin, I'll second. Okay, so we have a first and second. Uh, before we vote here, any any questions or comments or concerns that anyone's found? If not, then uh, all in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. All opposed, say no. Okay, very good. Hearing none, approval of uh, February 4th meeting minutes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item that I have under my topics here for welcome and introductions is to actually introduce uh, our acting health director, Robert Nodell. Uh, Robert, I, I heard that you uh, were here through the roll call. So if you would like, I'll, I'll give you a few minutes here if you uh, have any opening statement or if you want, if you would like to say anything to the committee or to those in attendance. No, I just appreciate the work that the committee members are doing and uh, Look forward to uh, look forward to working with you and uh, and working through the meeting today. So we'll, in the interest of time, we'll uh, I'll defer and uh, and look forward to the next item on the agenda. Okay, thank you and welcome to the committee and thank you for uh, for being here today. Uh, so to move right along, then uh, Kirk, we're coming to you next um, as the acting uh, uh, director. Uh, so a standing agenda item is the director's update. So I'll turn it over to you and you can kind of lead us through the, your presentation here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thought I would take just a moment here at the start to explain why you're hearing from me uh, at, for the director's update today. Uh, for the last 60 days or so, I've been acting director and some of you Many of you know, some may not, but Director Todd Richardson is on a leave of absence. And there have been lots of uh, well-wishers and inquiries about that. And I just wanna make sure everyone knows this was not due to some adverse condition or an illness or anything. He's actually had this planned for a while. Uh, Todd and Amber had long planned before their oldest child, their son Sawyer reached middle school and the activities of middle school and high school to take an extended trip in their RV and visit as many national parks as they could possibly hit. And so at last sighting, 
they were approaching Olympic National Park in Washington, having already been to the Grand Canyon and the Sequoia and Redwood National Forest. So uh, they are doing great. And he sends his well wishes to everybody on the committee. Um, he has a planned return this fall, probably in September, exact date uh, to be determined. So I have been serving as, um, as the acting director in his absence. Um, and actually in his absence, he's missing a lot of exciting things uh, going on at Mo, at Mo Health Net. Uh, and uh, my, my colleagues around me are chuckling. I should let you know that we have also in the room, Jesse Dresner, uh, uh, Leanne Hager, Nate Percy, uh, Sherry Hahn, general counsel at DSS, and of course, Gail's driving the bus here. And this is the maiden voyage of a uh, webcam in the, in the beautiful but not overly ostentatious conference room here at the Howerton building. Um, so we are now in the 21st century. We have webcam capabilities. Um, I mentioned that Todd's missing a lot of exciting things uh, happening at Mo HealthNet. There is a lot going on, and I really wanted to take a moment just to really express to the committee and make sure that you guys have a full appreciation for the staff that I, that I have. Um, with with the emerging from a pandemic, uh, in the middle of many, many transformation initiatives, uh, the governor's call to return our workforce to the office, which was not an easy thing to do, uh, you know, with connectivity and technology issues and everything. Through all of that, our staff have kept the trains running on time. We are serving Missouri's most vulnerable citizens in a way that is really remarkable. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't especially point out my senior, my senior management team. Jesse Dresner, when Todd went on uh, leave of absence, uh, became our deputy director officially, as well as chief operating officer. Uh, and she's shouldering some of that void of Todd not being here so I can continue to focus on transformational uh, initiatives. Uh, Tony Bright, our CFO, Darren Hackman, our CIO, and Josh Moore, our pharmacy director. You'll hear from all these people today. Uh, I just cannot express my thanks and gratitude for, for the support they've given me in Todd's absence but making sure that uh, our constituents are being served well. Um, so I thought I would give you a little bit, you will hear from all those people around operational things and, and transformational things, but I thought I would give you a few updates on some of the transformation initiatives that we have. There are some 40 plus transformation initiatives that are either completed or in flight or what we would call on deck. And I'm not in the interest of time, of course, going to hit all of those, but I would like to hit a few, give you guys a few updates. Uh, first of all, I'm really, really happy to announce uh, that we expanded the transformation office. Justin Clutter is now our transformation project manager. Uh, he came over, he's been in the MHD shop in our managed care department uh, brings a ton of background and knowledge to the role uh, to as, as transformation project manager. I'm really excited to have him on board. Another relatively recent hire, I know the committee has been made aware of this one, but I wanted to highlight it today, was we hired a program integrity pharmacist, Olivia Rush. And a little bit later in the program, you'll hear from Josh Moore on several topics. I'm gonna steal a little bit of his thunder now just to brag on Olivia's work. Uh, just yesterday, she uncovered a billing error on the part of a hospital that will result in the agency recouping a million dollars. Uh, this is the kind of work that she is taking on every day. Uh, huge kudos to her. To her. Uh, actually, Josh Moore, our pharmacy director, will explain a little bit more about that particular thing a little bit later in the program. He will also speak to our 340B drug program uh, transformation initiative. Um, and he'll also give you a real exciting update on uh, our, our hepatitis C elimination project, uh, whose aim is to eliminate hepatitis C in our state. That project is gonna launch on July 1. 
Uh, it is a really exciting project. I won't steal any more of Josh's thunder on that, but uh, he will be speaking about that in, in just a few minutes. Um, in past committee hearings, you've heard me speak about uh, transforming our benefits uh, application uh, process. And uh, we call it Missouri Benefits Enrollment Transformation. And you will recall that we engaged a partner from a, a human-centered design studio from Detroit, Michigan called Sevilla to help us transform our application for Missouri benefits, not just Missouri Medicaid, but uh, all the benefits. And uh, you will recall that if someone applied today for every benefit that is available to them through the state, meaning SNAP, TANF, <coughs> uh, child care assistance, Medicaid, they would fill out 63 different pieces of paper. Um, I'm really excited to announce to you at, that to, uh, when, when this new program, when the new application is available, uh, we've reduced that 63 pages to about 16. Uh, now there is an information booklet that can go along with this, but it, hopefully all of you received a copy of that. Gail sent that out to all of you yesterday. I think at our last committee hearing, uh, I think Senator Shoup asked if we could see that uh, application. So I wanted to make sure, uh, I apologize I didn't get it out to you sooner, but we did get it out yesterday. And you also received a, uh, a Medicaid only application. This process of redesigning the application, uh, it, during that process we learned that CMS, for states that have a multi-benefit application, will also require that we make available a Medicaid-only application. That's why that second application was sent out to you yesterday, just in sort of in full disclosure. And actually, uh, Kim Evans, uh, it will, it will be able to speak about this a little bit later as well. But we're in the implementation phase of the application. The redesign, the testing, that's all been completed. And our implementation is working through uh, Family Support Division. Uh, and Kim is the director there. She's gonna be speaking a little bit later as well. And uh, we're, really excited, we're really excited about it. We had targeted July 1 as our completion date, our readiness date for the application. Um, hopefully uh, with enough caveats that I can now tell you that we didn't quite make that. Uh, we're, it'll, be, it'll be a little bit later in the year, but the implementation process and training process has begun in FSD to get that on the road, which allowed us to then turn our partner Sevilla's attention toward redesigning some of our more often used notices and our written communication with our participants. And I would tell you, in my estimation, those notices are as important to be redesigned as our application. Um, some of our notices today can be very confusing, can be very uh, similar in appearance, which leads some of our participants to miss action items. Uh, they might get notices today that don't require action and then one that looks almost exactly like it that does require action. And just, that just leads to churn if, if they then, then become ineligible and it ties up more of our staff uh, as they reapply. And so Sevilla is currently redesigning the, uh, some of those notices. So that is uh, a really exciting part of our uh, transformation. In fact, uh, maybe I'll pause here to see if there are any questions about that right now. And I may enlist Kim uh, to help answer them. Any, anybody have any questions about that project? I know you've heard about it a couple times. Okay. I just allowed a moment there for the dreaded double mute uh, that sometimes catches people when they try to speak. Okay, um, I also wanted to talk about a little bit about the outpatient simplified fee schedule transformation initiative. You will recall that our current methodology for reimbursing hospitals for outpatient services is based on a percentage of billed charges. 
And that methodology that we've used for a long time has resulted in dramatic variations, gross variations in how we pay for the exact same procedure code just based on how the hospital sets their charges. We've, and it, it, it's also impacted by out-of-state hospitals who have been, there have been hospitals that have quite frankly been abusing this, this payment methodology. And uh, we are about to launch that, that uh, initiative. Um, the proposed rule has been submitted. Um, we are resubmitting our emergency rule uh, once the budget gets finalized by the governor. So we will be live with that initiative in both fee-for-service and managed care no later than January 1 and as early as July 1. We will be uh, live on the managed care side by July 1. Um, and so we're in the, uh, we're in the SPA comment period now and we, we did receive two or three comments that we are uh, responding to. So we're also really excited. That's been an initiative that's been very challenging, very hard. It's an initiative where some hospitals, yes, will uh, take less revenue for some of their outpatient services than they currently do. Some hospitals will actually make more and sometimes significant amounts on both sides of that equation. So it's uh, been a difficult and challenging initiative. We're really excited about its launch uh, coming up here later this summer. The last thing I wanted to address uh, today is not a uh, is not a transformation initiative. It has to do with uh, a funding source of the FRA, the Federal Reimbursement Allowance. Um, if you've been following the legislature, you know that the FRA bill was not renewed. It did not pass the legislature this year. And I don't think it can be overstated the impact that this will have on the program. Um, it, in all seriousness, the existence of the program will be threatened uh, by December of this year uh, without, this, without this bill being renewed. We will be, uh, th this bill impacts reimbursements for hospitals, nursing homes, pharmacies, ambulances, um, and literally without this bill getting across the finish line sometime soon, uh, the existence of the program will be threatened by the end of the year. Um, like I said, I cannot over, overstate the impact of and the importance of that. So um, I know there may be some questions about that as well. And so I'll pause here to see uh, what questions or comments uh, the committee might have. Yeah, Kurt, this is Nick Pranis too. I'm, I'm not I'm not seeing any questions coming okay. in on the chat, just letting you know that. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't have visibility to that, but uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Fanstill. This um, is Bridget. Do do you anticipate special session or um, how does this get resolved? That's a great question. The it, it does it will require a special session to get resolved. At, as of this date, I have no uh, no word from the governor that that is uh, been called or will or will be called or when at at this point. Anybody else have any uh, have any questions about that? Can you just speak to the actual dollar figure that comes in through FRA? So when, the, uh, when it did not pass, we did a very high level impact study. Uh, and uh, the first year would be roughly just less than a billion dollars, 0.9 billion dollars. The second year, that number would be about 1.4, I believe, um, 1.3 to 1.4 billion dollars.
be any lasting, any other? Will there be any lasting impact if this isn't renewed, say, until September or October? Are we financially okay until then? I, I, yeah, I think, I think we, we get into October before we start getting into real danger zone. Um, I, I think that uh, literally by the end of December, uh, we're, we're pretty much out of money. Um, but uh, if we get into, uh, if we get this resolved in September, uh, maybe early October, I think we will be okay. <clears throat> hey, Kirk, it's... Hey, Kirk. Yes. I hear what you're saying. I guess my concern is, you know, I'm assuming that like nursing homes, for example, are already having to put like emergency like plans in place in case they run out of money in December. So, I mean, is there any way we can help? How can we help? Is there any way we can share this kind of information just so that um, you know, our colleagues in the legislature realize that this is, you know, it's, it's serious and it's not something that should be used as a political football. Senator, I think any, any sharing of this information along those lines is going to be helpful. Um, I think that, um, uh, and I, I, I understand, you know, the, the, the politics as, as you know, um, but absolutely. I mean, it is crippling. We, it's not the absence of the FRA by the end of December means it's challenging for us to make payroll to our own staff, much less pay providers. Right. So that that was Representative McCreary, and I'm gonna. This is Senator oh, Schubert. I'm, I was just gonna. That's okay. I just wanted to let you know, and I was gonna follow up and say. So part of I think the question that that I would like an answer to is. In anticipation of this not happening, um, are you starting? Are we having to cut back now? And what does that look like? We are we are making plans. We are not cutting back now. That's not the way I would characterize it, Senator. But we are making contingency plans. Uh, that and that's probably about as as. Um, you know, we, we understand the seriousness of it, the possibility that it, it could not pass, it, that might be possible. So we are making plans. I would not say we're ready to uh, start cutting back or, or roll those plans out at this point. So um, when we don't provide the state share, my understanding is that the federal share that you, that you spoke about a little earlier does not come down. So, I mean, that's really the whole point of doing this. Right, so we're going to be getting zero um, in response to not sending those state dollars or not providing those state dollars. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, that, that, that's right, Senator. This is really about drawing down federal dollars. The, the FRA tax as, as is a volunteer tax, a provider tax on those four, en four ent provider groups that I mentioned. Um, and that tax is, is really designed to maximize what we draw down in, on federal dollars. Thank you. You bet. You bet. Any other any other questions that we can uh, uh, address now? Okay. Uh, so I'm sorry. This is Senator Shoup again and Representative McCurry. And um, while we're in this arena, not having um, put money in the budget for Medicaid expansion. Um, I'm wondering what that looks like uh, on July 1st. It sounds as if the governor does not want to accept new enrollees. How is all this 
you know, we have two big problems around Medicaid. And um, so if, if you could just address what, what our thoughts are, what your thoughts are, will the governor come back? Will there be money put in the budget in a supplemental to expand Medicaid? What are your, what are you hearing or seeing with regard to that? Senator, um, unfortunately, due to the fact that there has been litigation filed, um, I am unable to comment on that. Okay, understood. Yeah, so this is this is Nick Fanisto. So I think I think we'll take this opportunity here after Senator Shoup's question to just make sure everyone on the committee is is kind of I guess up to date on the actions that happened late last week. Um, so uh, there was uh, litigation or lawsuit filed uh, last Thursday, I believe, around one o'clock in the afternoon, um, in regards to Medicaid expansion. And so um, I, I think that's where Director uh, Matthews is is coming from there uh, because of those actions and those steps that have that have uh, taken place. Uh, there's now ramifications of what can be and when what cannot be discussed in that regard. And so. Uh, for us as committee members, uh, we're going to kind of have to, um, we, I know we all certainly have questions, but we're going to have to kind of sit and wait and see what happens uh, through that process before I, unfortunately, before I think we're going to get really any more information. Uh, Director Matthews, uh, do you have, uh, are there other items uh, on your agenda or did, did that bring you to the end of your agenda? That brought me to the end of my remarks. Chairman okay. Fanciel, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I will hand it back to you or over to Jesse Dresner, who is up next, however yeah, you prefer. So if, if, thank you, thank you, Kirk. If, if there are no other uh, questions for Director Matthews, then um, uh, we will move on to Jesse Dresner for her Chief Operating Officer update. Jesse, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Dr. Fanciel. Um, so, just a, a very brief couple slides to preview a presentation we hope to have at the next quarter's oversight uh, committee meeting. This is something that, that uh, some of the committee members have brought up as an area of interest for a presentation. So, um, talking a little bit about home and community-based services. And the HCBS are designed to keep individuals in their home, in the community, as opposed to being in a long-term care institution. So, Gail, if you'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Just wanted to do a very brief run-through for the committee about the home and community-based services that MoHealthNet provides and, and in partnership with um, our colleagues at the Department of Health and Senior Services and Mental Health as well. So. We do uh, provide services through a number of 1915C waivers, and a 1915C waiver is specifically an HCBS waiver. And so we're going to talk a little bit about those uh, waivers at hopefully next quarter's meeting. We really wanted to do this last year, but I think with COVID and so many other things coming up, uh, you know, really requiring our attention, this, this got put off a little bit. So we do provide services through the waivers. We also provide uh, services through our state plan. And those include private duty nursing, personal care, home health, and respite. And you'll see several on the slide, several different waivers that um, the Department of Health and Senior Services administers, as well as some waivers that the Department of Mental Health administers. And then, it, you know, just not to confuse, we do also have some waivers that aren't necessarily um, HCBS specific, like our Gateway to Better Health waiver, but we can touch on that a little bit too in our recently approved targeted benefits for postpartum women waiver. Um, there's, I left it off the slide, but we also um, have the program Money Follows the Person, and that's an interesting one we've had great success with. So I wanna be sure that I um, touch on that one as well. So just knowing that those are the different items that MoHealthNet covers, um, just any time between now and the next quarterly meeting, I would love to hear feedback about specific questions you have, specific areas of interest, and then we're gonna invite um, health and mental health and MO Health Net, all three to present on these services for you at the next meeting. So I'll take a pause there if there are any questions about that or any areas that you want me to take note of today. Uh, this is Senator Shoup. I was curious as to, I think that there are 
an additional bump in the federal matching funds, 10% in the American Rescue Plan. And I don't know how that fits into these areas or how you're planning on using them, whether that would go um, to increasing provider rates, to adding new services, increasing the waiver capacity, et cetera. So just curious as to where we are in, in that process. Absolutely. Um, great question. So um, there was a state Medicaid director letter that went out um, a week or so ago um, with some additional guidance around this, uh, developing the spend plans. And so um, most, mostly health and senior services and the Department of Mental Health are working on um, some ideas and some drafts there. So things are still in draft form, but definitely by the time we do this presentation, we'll have, we'll have information all around that as well. Thank you. All right, well, just a couple other items that were on the list, um, follow-ups to touch on a little bit of a COVID update. Just some numbers around uh, the state of Missouri. We've got for our population over 18, 51% um, have received their initial dose. So we're running a little bit behind national average, which is 61.5, but not looking too bad. 43% of our population over 18 have received um, both doses, and that's very close to the national average of 49.8%. Um, states still doing a lot of PCR and antigen testing, and uh, the PCR rate, uh, the rolling last seven-day average is at 3.9%, with the antigen at 3.8, so very close there, and um, still trending in, in the right direction. So we're doing about, I wrote the number down somewhere, almost 17,000. Um, vaccines a day, so very exciting. And then in the MoHealthNet uh, world, Kirk touched on this a little bit, but we've returned to the office. We've got a little over 200 people here at MoHealthNet, and at the height of the pandemic, had successfully gotten everybody to work from an alternate location, most folks at home, um, with only about 10 people coming into the office. And so we pivoted a couple weeks ago, and uh, last week actually, and came back to the office. And it's good. It's good to see everybody again. And um, so we're just we're back to work here. Very proud that folks were able to, to accomplish what they did over the past, you know, 13, 14, 15 months from home and, and then to be able to turn around and come back. But it's it's been great for, for us to get to see each other again. Um, and then I had a couple other things to follow up on. I touched base with Josh Moore, who's going to talk here in a bit, I think. Um, if he had heard any further feedback on the on the LARC, the long-acting reversible contraception, he said he hadn't gotten any yet. And, and honestly, I think we've just been so busy with so many other topics. I know as he has a chance to talk with practitioners more, he'll get some more feedback. But I did take a, a closer look with the help of folks from Family Support and Nate Percy, who's here in the room, and Ashley Wilson at, at MoHealthNet about the trends on the extended women's health services. Um, Dr. McCandless, you had mentioned a drop, and so we really wanted to go and take a more historical look, and it's very interesting, and the more I look into this, the more questions I have, <laughs> so more to come on it, but actually since June of 17, we went back to look in June of 17 each month to the present, and we've actually had a very steady decline. It isn't something that's been very recent. So, for instance, 67, almost 68,000 participants on extended women's health services um, plan in June of 2017. So, almost 68,000. When you get to June of 2018, we're at 62,000. June of 2019, it's dropped to 49,000. June of 2020, it's steady at 49,000. So actually, we had a more significant decrease in a few years back than we have had recently. So I know we've talked to um, some of our, our team members at Family Support, and we thought about um, ways to dig into this a little bit more. And so there are the obvious factors about um, you know people moving out of state and things like that. But the, the eligibility question really is, were there fewer people eligible for any kind of benefit package after their 60 days postpartum, or were there more individuals who are actually eligible for a different package? So a little bit more for us to dig into there, but we also on the MoHealthNet front wanna, wanna see what we can take a look at just to determine were there at the front end 
a reduced number of pregnancies? Is there a trend in hospital utilization, pharmacy trend? Is there a clinic trend? Is it tied to increased contraceptive usage? Um, and, and, just, and how to track that can be difficult. We were actually taking a look at that this morning on contraceptive utilization because we know what we pay for, but we can't tie it to an exact number when it comes to utilization. So I just did want to update the committee on that since that's been an ongoing question and let you know that um, there, it just keeps bringing more questions along to answer. So we're going to keep taking a look at that. And lastly, um, another question that had come up from the committee, and I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Paul Stuvey, um, is about our data and our ability to disaggregate data according to race, gender, other demographic figures um, and elements and, and what we can do with that and what that looks like. So I'll pause and see if there are any questions and then I'll hand it back over to Dr. Fannin Steele if you would like, um, if you have anything else before we move to Dr. Stubbe. Hi, it's, Tra it's yep. Tracy McCreary. I'm using uh, Senator Shoup's microphone. Um, I have a question. We had talked at, in past meetings about uh, changing the algorithm for figuring out who's eligible for personal care services. Are, are, um, is your team still planning to make those changes? So that, that um, effort lies with the Division of Senior and Disability Services with the Department of Health and Senior Services. And I will be more than happy. I'll make a note right now and um, check in with the folks over there and we can send an update to the committee afterward. Okay, yeah, that would be helpful because I, um, I think that they are, um, that there was some target deadline of July 30th. So that will be before our next meeting. So that would be helpful. Um, we're just, I'm trying to figure out, one of my concerns is, you know, we're in this situation where we're still trying to help Missourians recover from the pandemic. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, are people going to, um, you know, lose eligibility? Are we going to, you know, what are we going to do with folks? Will they be able to still be taken care of at home or will they have to be put into an institution? That kind of thing. I, I feel like there are a lot of balls in the air right now um, because of changes that we're doing, but also, you know, we have ex external things like the pandemic and, and economic recovery that are going on and those are kind of outside of our control. <clears throat> Absolutely, and I know the department has been contemplating those questions. So I will I will reach out and we'll get something out to the committee um, before, before well before the next meeting. Okay, very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good. Are there any other questions uh, for Jesse on on her update? Hey Nick, this is a uh, Gerard Grimaldi. Uh, Jesse, what's the? Uh, I just need a memory refresher on the gateway waiver. When was it most recently approved and how long is it now in effect for? Boy, Dr. Grimaldi, that's probably going to be a Kim Evans question. Okay, we'll get, we can get it later. Thanks. And thank you for the promotion. Sorry, this is Nick Fanisto. So I'm assuming Kim's not uh, on the meeting or the call yet. Yeah, thanks for the promotion. Oh. <laughs> I am well, I am on the call. This is Kim. Let me get the um, the information, and when I give my update, I will have all of those dates for you. Okay. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Does that does that work okay, uh, Gerard? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. And you're welcome for the promotion, Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> Tell my boss, would you? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Very good. Any other questions for uh, Jesse on her update? I guess just clarification from my standpoint, Jesse, when you said that we'll get those numbers out to the committee members, uh, Gail, will you uh, make sure that we get those emailed out and not just prior, if, if at all possible, not just prior to the, our next meeting, but actually prior to any deadline that would be upcoming on that topic, as Representative yeah, McCreary pointed out. Yeah, we will. As soon as we get the information, we'll get it out to them. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Jesse, for your update. Uh, so, Dr. Stuvey, we're going to turn it over to you for the next uh, topic, disaggregated presentation. Great. Good afternoon. Can folks hear me okay? Yes, I'm picking we hear you up just loud and clear. All right. Great. Okay. 
so as Jesse said, I, I understand there's been some interest in the committee about our Medicaid data and, and uh, whether we might uh, stratify or, or disaggregate that data on occasion. I think we can go to the next slide there. I've got a few slides here. Yeah, uh, so the, the answer is yes, we, we can and we do stratify our data for a number of purposes, including reporting of annual healthcare metrics, um, identifying healthcare disparities, developing interventions, things of that nature. Um, there are a number of common variables that we use for stratification as seen here, but really any variable that's included in our member data set can be used for stratification purposes. So here you see age, gender, race, et cetera, um, other possibilities might include um, income, although, you know, the income restrictions on Medicaid probably remove a lot of variability with that variable, but um, still. Um, literacy, educational background, um, access to public transportation, um, other types of geographic variables like residents in high crime areas or in older buildings that might be more likely to have lead paint, um, things like that. Um, if it's something that's in our data set or, or if it's in a data set that we can join to, um, we can use that variable to stratify or, or to disaggregate results. Uh, next slide. So I've got just a few examples here of, of, uh, of what we're doing with, with uh, some of our data. Um, these are a few examples of, of stratifying data by race. I have um, some of our uh, healthcare metrics for, for women's health. Um, these are HEDIS uh, breast cancer screening rates broken down by race for calendar year 2019. Um, the counts for a number of the races in Missouri are quite small, as you see. Uh, but there are some noticeable differences here, particularly that black women have a slightly higher rate than white women for breast cancer screening. And uh, the rate for Asian women is a bit higher still, although still with, with far fewer Asian members. The, the other race categories have denominators that are less than 30, which is typically the cutoff that CMS um, uses for reporting. So um, those are really too small to, to uh, um, make, much, uh, make much of. Uh, next slide. Hey, Paul. Yeah, uh, sorry. Th this is this is Gerard again. Um, are these hey. fee, are these managed care or fee for service or a combination? These are um, yeah, these are a combination. These are Medicaid wide uh, for for adults, um, both fee for service and managed care for these numbers here. I have some that are just managed care coming up in a few slides, but these are for the entire program. Do you have a sense of the proportion of managed care versus fee for service? Um, not at my fingertips, no. For for um, uh, I could find that, um, but I'd have to look for it here. It would take me a few minutes. No, that's fine. Uh, if Why you could I... let us know after, okay. later on, it would be an interesting uh, comparison to see. Thanks. Sure. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the next slide uh, shows the same rates for cervical cancer screening. Um, and again, we see higher denominators uh, for these. Um, so all of these would be above, obviously, the, the 30 cutoff that CMS recommends. Um, once again, black women have the highest rate of cervical cancer screenings uh, in calendar 19. Um, and there's some variations around there, as you see. And then one more slide for women's health is postpartum care. Uh, and these rates are highest for Asian women and lowest for, for black and uh, also for Hawaiian uh, Pacific Islander, although the counts for that last group are, are fairly small, still above 30, but they're, they're among the smallest that we have here. Um, so some fluctuations back and forth in these, in these measures. Um, there's not a, a clear trend, you know, for a particular race across all the measures, but there are some variations, and this is one of the things that we report to CMS um, annually with our with our healthcare metrics each year. I'll pause for a second and take questions before I move on to some um, uh, child measures. Okay. Next slide. So these show data from our three managed care plans. Um, they, they use slightly different race groupings, as you see, than the ones that, that I just showed you. But we're working with them to get a common list that matches the groups that, uh, that were just displayed so that will make comparisons easier and have some consistency. Um, and these slides show data related to well-child visits for children in different age groups. Um, this one is for infants. 
um, and is the number of children uh, who received six or more well child visits during their first 15 months of life. Um, and the rate here is uh, lower. Uh, well, let's see here. We've got some variations between the plans. Um, but it's uh, actually, I think these slides, I, I apologize. I, these slides are reversed uh, from, uh, I rearranged them after I sent the deck to, um, uh, to, to send out. So for the adolescent ones here, let me actually go ahead. Um, to the well child for uh, age zero to 15 months. Yeah, there we go. That's the one that I was talking about. Okay. So this rate is lower for black and for white infants. Um, there's some uh, lower rates still for Asian, although the, the ends there are fairly small. Um, and again, uh, some different categories that, you know, some of the plans we have, you know, one of the plans is using the category for Indian, one is using the category for Native American or Hispanic. So it's a little difficult to make some comparisons there. Um, but as I say, we're going to get these uh, so that they all align. Um, so that was starting with the youngest uh, uh, child age group. The next slide, I, for age three to six, there we go. Okay. Um, so the trend reverses here where black children are more likely to have their well child visits than white children in this age group. Um, and then for the adolescent one, yeah, there we go, yeah. Uh, similar rates uh, here, the, the rates are higher for black adolescents and white adolescents with some variation among the other races. That, uh, that zero for Indian, um, and that's due to a very, very small N. There was, there was one um, uh, child uh, and, uh, in home state for, for uh, this measure, and that child did not have a well care visit during the calendar 19. Uh, so that's what that zero means. It's just a, a very, very small N. So um, it seems possible that some of these differences, you know, they, the findings would look a little different if we broke out the results um, by another stratification category like region. Um, and it might be the case that access to services is more available in urban areas and that black women are more likely to live in urban areas, which might help explain uh, some of the relative differences in these rates. But uh, sometimes combining multiple categories of stratification can, you know, shed additional light on what you're seeing. And that's what I had briefly. Are there any questions about this or any further discussion that people want to have about these data and uh... this is Bridget. Um, I apologize hey. for the background noise. Yes, go ahead. We lost you. I'm I'm sorry, Bridget. I'm not able this to is understand. Is, is anyone else hearing Bridget? Our, am I there? Can you hear me? Yep, Dr. McCandless, we can't. We're we're cutting out very um, a lot. We can't really understand any questions. If you want to try the chat, I might be able to uh, respond uh, if I could see a question in the chat. But we're not able to understand what you're saying um, through the audio. I have a question for you, and it's very basic, and I apologize to the group, but for these managed care companies, is, do they have a financial incentive or some other incentive to make sure as many of these uh, children from birth through school age get in for their well child care? Like, what, what are we doing? Like, to say that, oh, it looks good because white women are getting their kids in, they're still, like, about 50% of kids that aren't getting in for these visits, and that's alarming to me. Yeah, the, these rates are lower than we would like them to be. We do have a withhold program, which is on the agenda coming up uh, in just a few minutes here. And I think I'll, I'll defer some of those questions to, to that. Um, and I, I believe that, that the well child visits are indeed one of the categories that we have on the withhold, but um, Justin Clutter can speak more to that. Um, but yeah, we, I, we, we do have some incentives, I believe, to help uh, bring these rates up. We, we do want to see them higher than they are. Yeah, so representative, uh, 
If you're okay with that, um, when we get down to the managed care update, I think we can ask Bobby, Joe, and, and Justin to maybe speak to that and, uh, and give you maybe a little bit more of a clear answer on that. Because I, I think the answer is yes, uh, but, but we're going to need those experts to kind of uh, fill us in on that. I see in the chat here um, regarding managed care data in, um, I'm not sure I'm understanding what this means. In Nest RFP, next, next RFP. Um, I'm still not sure what you're meaning by that. And also nursing home data. If you could clarify more, I'm not, not sure what you're asking about that. I can say the managed care plans do do submit data to us uh, every year. There's a number of measures. Um, yeah, the, the, the stuff that I showed just now is a, is a small subset of the measures that we receive from the managed care plans every year. There, there are, um, you know, a couple dozen measures that they report to us um, along these lines. Um, this is just a selection of, of children measures for today's talk, but we have a lot of them related to behavioral health and uh, um, diabetes and, and uh, assorted other measures. Um, and a lot of those are reported to CMS uh, every year. A lot of them we use in-house, um, but those are, a number of them are in the contract and I think we're gonna be expanding them um, a bit. Um, the uh, CMS requires, uh, well, they don't require yet. They encourage states to report um, core set measures every year and they're going to be required starting in 2024 and we'll be passing that requirement on to our managed care plans to make sure that they're crunching those numbers and reporting them to us so that we have them available uh, for CMS uh, in a couple of years from now. We do post some of these measures on our website and we're working on expanding the number of measures that are available uh, publicly. And of course, the stuff that is reported to CMS um, is uh, publicly available on their websites. They have a number of uh, scorecards and things like that where they display state rates uh, for folks to just, you know, log on to on the web and, and, and review. Okay, very good. Any other questions for uh, Dr. Stuvey? Um, oh, uh, Bridget, we had another one come in just asking if, if she can visit um, offline with, uh, with a follow up conversation, Dr. Stuvey. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Would enjoy that. Absolutely. So, Bridget, let's, uh, you, we can work through uh, Gail to see if we can uh, set that up to where you can communicate with Dr. Stuvey offline. Any other questions for Dr. Stuvey on his presentation? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Dr. Stuvey. And thank you very much. We'll be moving on to uh, Josh next for the uh, pharmacy update, uh, specifically talking about hepatitis C elimination plan. Josh, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much. My name is Josh Moore. I'm director of pharmacy here at MoHealthNet. Uh, before we talk about hepatitis C elimination plan, I wanted to touch on two of the other items that Kirk mentioned in the um, initial briefing. For 340B, we have started our work and are in the process of implementing the new 340B purchase drug reimbursement on July 1st of this year. Um, 340B isn't probably something a lot of people on the committee are familiar with. It is a program which allows covered entities to purchase drugs at significantly discounted prices, um, referred to most commonly as ceiling prices, and then also sub-ceiling prices, so prices even lower than the ceiling cost. The ceiling cost, um, to put it in kind of plain language, is basically what Medicaid pays for a drug after the federal rebate. Um, and whenever we look at the federal rebate, those can vary anywhere from 23.1% for a brand name medication all the way up to basically 100%. Um, so there's quite a bit of variance there as well. As we look at our ceiling uh, priced purchase drugs, we're probably hovering close to around 55% off of the WAC price uh, between what the list price of a medication is and the price after the federal rebate. 
the reason why we need to change the reimbursement on these uh, 340B purchase drugs is because CMS in 2017 actually put forth a covered outpatient drug rule, which requires Medicaid to pay for drugs um, on actual acquisition cost basis. Prior to that, we had been paying on a variety of estimated um, acquisition costs. So the actual acquisition cost changes for all of the rest of pharmacy and, and the, all the rest of physician administered drugs took place actually back in 2018. And 340B has, has been the holdover that we are now working through. Uh, why is this important for the state budget? We actually end up paying on a state share portion about 112% more for the average medication when it's dispensed through a 340B uh, provider compared to what we would pay after all rebates and state and federal share split for going to a, a normal retail pharmacy for the same medication. I've got a couple of examples uh, that I can run through too to kind of put some numbers on around this. Unfortunately, we're not able to talk about specific drugs unless the manufacturer has actually publicly disclosed them. So I can't tell you how much it is for, for just any drug off the top of the list. But uh, luckily, uh, Lilly actually published their 340B price for Humalog insulin. And, and that runs 10 cents for a vial uh, for their ceiling price. To give you an idea on how that compares to the wholesale acquisition list price, it's actually $274 for the same vial. So when we reimburse a pharmacy for, a non-340B pharmacy for a vial of that insulin, they're purchasing it at about $263, and we are reimbursing them about $263. The state share for that, after we've done all the rebates and all the um, uh, state and federal split, brings the cost to Missouri for the vial of insulin, the Hemolog insulin, down to three and a half cents. Under our current reimbursement methodology, um, those facilities that are 340B entities are buying that vial of insulin for the, the 10 cents, probably some administration fees as well in there. Uh, we're reimbursing them $206 for that vial of insulin under a current reimbursement methodology, which means the state share for that vial of insulin then turns into $72 because we are not allowed to collect any rebates for a 340B purchase drug. When we look at an average medication, um, and we looked at one particular quarter and uh, second quarter of 2020 and third quarter of 2020 for 340B claims, our average wholesale acquisition cost for a drug through a non-340B facility is about $208. Uh, so after rebates and federal and state share is accounted for, the state share out of general revenue comes to about $25.50. When we look at a 340B purchase medication, again, looking at that $208 wholesale acquisition cost, the ceiling price on those tend to be on average $97. We're reimbursing $154 for those medications and the state share ends up being $54.05. So again, a little bit over double what we would pay for a non-340B purchase medication. The reason why it's also important that we revise our 340B methodology is because some items actually have a lower statutory rebate than the 25% off of wholesale acquisition costs that we currently reimburse at. So some of these gene therapies for pediatric indications have a rebate that's much smaller um, at 17%. So when you look at a claim such as Zolgensma and look at just the, the uh, statutory rebates, a uh, facility that administers Zolgensma to a patient could lose up to $150,000 under a current reimbursement methodology. Right now, with the methodology as it is today, I think there's enough money there that it offsets the losses, the, the products that they're being reimbursed over the acquisition cost. Um, but 
as we look at the future and these gene therapies that can be administered to little kids, I think we have to start worrying about massive access issues if we continue to reimburse it at this uh, estimated acquisition cost. So it's very important that we go live with the new methodology on July 1st so that we don't run into an issue where facilities start turning away participants that need to receive these life-saving gene therapies. That's a lot of numbers that I threw out at you for 340B. We actually have a, a short presentation that we do, and, and I think Todd has shared it with a few people as well, that kind of outlines the position of where we're over reimbursing and under reimbursing. Um, but it is vital that we continue down this path and go live on July 1st with 340B reimbursement changes. Any questions on 340B before I move to white bagging? Now, this is Gerard, I got a request. Uh, if you could send that short presentation to the entire committee, that would be great. And the other thing I put out about the genesis of the 340B program, it was uh, done to help those high volume safety net providers, uh, including rural hospitals, uh, to make uh, to help them with some of the uh, services they're providing to their patients, and that uh, all the savings on 340B are supposed to be passed on directly to the patients, and obviously that's uh, going to be more challenging with that without those 340B savings not coming to the providers. Yeah, and, and I can send that presentation on to Gail so she can pass it around. Um, one more thing to point out on 340B, 340B, uh, this, these changes are for Medicaid only. This does not change how facilities uh, would bill private insurance and the prices that they are allowed to charge to private insurance for these drugs um, or no. to cash customers. Yeah, but it does have a huge impact on those providers that have a significantly high volume of Medicaid. I just want to point that out. Uh, I see that Jill asked the question, does this uh, new 340B program limit patients' access to certain drugs? Uh, we will be paying accurately for the 340B drugs, um, and we are actually allowing facilities the ability to indicate if the drug was purchased through the 340B program or not. What that allows the facility to do is if, for instance, the drug A uh, they're not able to get through the 340B program. Under our current reimbursement methodology, we would still reimburse them at 25% off the list price. So on that drug, they could, in theory, be losing 25%, um, and we would reimburse them accurately for purchasing at the wholesale acquisition cost. So we would pay them uh, basically the list price. There's a few more caveats to how that works, but uh, in its basic form, that's how it would work. And uh, we are the, I believe, 49th state to uh, change our 340B methodology to go to the actual acquisition cost. So this is not something that uh, is new to Medicaid's across the country. It, it's definitely, most states actually went to this in 2017 and 2018. All right. Next up, I have white bagging. Oh, wait, sorry. Tracy McCreary asked, is there a financial incentive disincentive for providers to prescribe certain drugs? Um, you know, I, I would like to think that providers are prescribing and dispensing medications based on what the participant needs, not based on the financial incentives there. There are drugs that have very, very high list prices. Uh, that have very, very high rebates associated with them. So there are certain products uh, like the Hemolog insulin that I pointed out where a facility um, could potentially make a large amount of money on a fairly small investment. I, I hope that that's not occurring, but um, I have no idea to, if I'm able to look into the mind of the prescriber and facility to see if that's actually what's happening. So. I can't really comment on whether or not the financial incentives and disincentives are actually being followed through on. We'll give it one more minute for any more questions that come through. All 
All right. Seeing none. Uh, next up, we talked very briefly about white bagging at the very beginning of the meeting. Kirk pointed that out that Olivia had found a billing, uh, hopefully an error uh, or oversight on white bagging. So there's a few different uh, terms that we're going to go over. Uh, in a normal pharmacy situation, you would walk into your pharmacy, they would dispense something along the lines of a, an oral medication or something like that. You would go home and you would take it. In, in other instances, there's what's called white bagging and brown bagging. In a brown bagging situation, they would dispense to you an injectable medication or a device of some kind. You would take it to your provider's office and they would administer the medication there. In a white bagging situation, the pharmacy will fill the medication, bill the payer, and then send it directly to the provider's office to be administered to the patient when the patient comes to the office next. What we've discovered is it looks like there was a billing issue where the pharmacy was billing for the service, uh, the medication, sending it to the facility to be administered to the participant, and then when it was being administered to the participant by the provider, the provider was billing for the drug as well. So we were paying twice for the same medication for the same patient, um, which resulted in a significant amount of money uh, for the facility that we've looked into. We're currently working on a project now to send out probably letters to providers to self-disclose um, any of these occurrences that might have happened, and then we will be starting our review of others to check into how widespread this practice is. Any questions on white bagging? So uh, I've, got a comment. I've got a comment, not a question. This is Gerard again. Uh -huh. uh, many of the payers and I recognize this does not apply to the Missouri Medicaid program as long as pharmacy is carved out, I believe. But we need to be really concerned, and I'm sure there are a gazillion hospital pharmacists who would convey this if we ever see this coming. Uh, a, there's, there's a real concern about payers moving these drugs from the medical benefit to the pharmacy benefit. And they're basically outsourcing from the pharmacy, and there's real serious concern about uh, quality issues when uh, they are sent from a third-party formulary to a hospital with the mandate that the hospital cannot uh, do the drug internally. It's kind of a complicated issue, but I just want to point out there are serious quality concerns about what uh, is occurring in the private payer world that we don't want to see evolve into the Medicaid world. Absolutely. I have no intent of requiring a uh, one way or the other. I think the way that we have it set up now is the best for the participant because it allows them the freedom of choice along with the provider. Um, I just want to make sure that when we do pay for a medication, we only pay for it one time sure. instead of paying for the same bottle twice. So that, that's totally going to be our, our big focus. Yeah. We just want to be uh, cognizant of the patient safety issues as this, uh, we're seeing some other things in the private payer world that are causing some challenges. So thanks. Yeah, I definitely want to stay away from the point of, I, I think in the private sector, you see some of these private insurances forcing you to go with their own specialty pharmacy. And then you show up to, on the day of the appointment and the patient weighs 10 pounds more than you thought. The dose changes, you don't have enough of the drug anymore, and, and you're kind of stuck in this limbo. That's, that's not something we want to do to a patient when we already have a hard enough time getting their, them there in the first place. Um, what happens to the pharmacies that are disclosed? So some of these relationships are actually pretty complex, so that's why we're going to be writing a letter for first uh, to allow people to disclose. Um, it might be the pharmacy is not supposed to be billing us and the uh, provider is. It might be that the provider uh, isn't supposed to be billing us, but they are. So we, we, we want to make sure that people are reviewing those relationships before we start digging in and, and making any accusations. We know it's occurring, but we don't know who should not have billed us for the service. Some examples of drugs that are white and brown bagged. The most popular brown bagged uh, products that I can think of is going to be your Depo-Provera. 
Uh, that's the long-acting injectable birth control. And that drug, you can go to your local retail pharmacy and get Depo-Provera and then take it to the doctor's office and they perform the injection there. A lot of people also do it at home too. In terms of white bagging, uh, there are a ton of those. Uh, so those tend to be your more expensive drugs that you would see um, that come from specialty limited distribution pharmacies. Uh, Spinraz is probably one of them. Uh, there are some implants as well that would come through those. So a, a lot of white bag prescription. We're not talking here about like your lisinopril and your cholesterol meds, those kinds of things. We're talking about more specialized items. Uh, white bagging would also be a lot of your chemotherapy agents. All right, any more questions on that initiative? Okay, cool. We'll go to hepatitis C elimination. This is the one that we're really excited on. Uh, we actually started work on this project back in September of 19. Um, and, and are really happy to share with the group what we're doing. So hepatitis C elimination plan. Uh, population under the age of 30, um, growing concern due to the injection drug use behaviors, which puts them at higher risk of hepatitis C infection. Uh, those under the age of 30 accounted for 19.5% of all chronic hep C cases in 2015 in Missouri. Baby boomers, persons born between 1945 and 1965 accounted for uh, 43% of those cases in 2015. And then opioid, especially heroin use, uh, is on the rise in Missouri and nationally as a leading risk factor for hepatitis C infection. Uh, one thing that's not on this slide is the uh, r not value among uh, people who inject drugs. When we talk about COVID and we really start getting stressed when that number gets over one, with hepatitis C, for people who inject drugs, that number gets over four, to give you an idea of how, how serious this is. Let's go to the next slide, please. So what are we doing here at MoHealthNet? We, we did a bid solicitation, um, and we have partnered with AbV in what's called a modified subscription model. And our target is to eliminate hepatitis C in the MoHealthNet population, but then also to raise awareness so that others that are not in MoHealthNet, those that are on private insurance, are also aware that a cure is available and really working towards elimination of hepatitis C. Maverick is actually the product that Abby has, and it can cure people in as little as eight weeks. And I have 97% cure rate on here, but it's actually 98% uh, cure rate for those people that take the eight weeks of Maverick. Our contract runs from July 1st of this year till June of 2024. In that time, we want to make a significant dent in the number of people infected with hepatitis C in the state of Missouri. How are we gonna do this? We are going to eliminate all prior authorization on Maverick. If a doctor writes for Maverick for you, our goal is that it's just as easy as going into the pharmacy and getting amoxicillin. I know that there's some uh, probably concern with pharmacy stocking that much Maverick when the list price is pretty significant, but we want to make sure that there's no paperwork that the, farm, the provider needs to do in order to get that prescription filled. We're also going to allow for the prescriber to write one prescription for the entire duration of therapy. Uh, over 90% of people will be able to take Maverick for just eight weeks uh, and get cured. So again, we're gonna allow the eight weeks of therapy at once, but there are some people that require up to 16 weeks, depending on certain clinical criteria, and we're gonna allow them to get all 16 weeks at a time. Because what we don't wanna do is have a person come in today, get one month, and then be no longer eligible for Medicaid next month, or have some kind of issue getting to the um, pharmacy or their provider and not get the next month, and have wasted the medication for that month. We want to make sure that whatever that patient can have on hand, they actually get to utilize. A uh, little bit on the money side, that contract's going to allow us to pay a lower rate net of rebate up to a threshold. And then after the threshold, the price moves to a nominal amount. 
based on the way the contract's written, I'm not able to share with the group what that threshold is, um, but I have every intention of us being able to hit it. Our goal is to test, to treat, and cure every participant infected with HCV during the three-year time period. And we are partnering with Missouri Primary Care Association, Project ECHO, AVV, and DHSS to try and get the word out and make sure as many people as possible know about this program. Want to go to the next slide, please? A little bit of background numbers on how many people are currently infected. I put on there that we have a backlog of 6,639 participants untreated for HCV. We are not, we don't have a backlog of requests that we haven't approved yet. What the backlog is, is people that we've looked in their claims history, they have a positive diagnosis of hepatitis C, but have no record of any of these um, agents being used to cure their HCV. This is based on our current MoHealthNet eligible population. And I can tell you, there are not enough specialists in the state of Missouri to treat every single patient for hep C if we line them up person to person. We have to get primary care, FQHCs, everybody we can possibly find to start treating HCV that's willing to. Because we want to get through those 6,600 and also find those people that haven't yet been diagnosed. Wanna go to the next slide, please? What our ask is of providers is for anybody that's at high risk, they need to get tested for HCV. Um, once we find out that they're positive for HCV, then we need to get them treated. And then providers lastly need to provide us any feedback they have on any other barriers to treating their mental health net participants. We want to be here, we want to help as much as we possibly can. Um, and that is all I have on Hep C. We're really excited about this program. Very good, thank you, Josh. Are there any questions for Josh on on the hepatitis C portion of of his presentation, or or any lingering questions that were not answered on the first two topics? Okay, hearing none, and I don't hey, I don't see uh, any new ones on the chat. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this is this is Gerard. I got a couple questions. One on the uh, the the backlog, and I understand your explanation of it. Do you have a a breakdown of rural versus urban? I don't have that breakdown right now. We're building a dashboard, um, and we're hoping to get county by county level data, uh, and we're looking to mirror it off of the COVID vaccine website. Um, I don't know if you've been on that website lately, but we're trying to go for the same look and feel. Okay, so sure. So we can look county by county and not only know uh, who's in fact, who, who has the infections, but also cures and um, where the tests are occurring. Because we know that the biggest number is gonna be number of tests given. And then okay. out of that, there'll be a number that are positive and out of that number cured. Okay, and then, um... What about involving and encouraging hospitals to be a part of this partnership, especially we the high Medicaid hospitals? We can definitely reach out to MHA and get them involved too. That'd be great. Thanks. Very good. Any other questions for Josh? Okay, hearing none, Josh, thank you for the presentation. Thanks for the information and, and uh, definitely thanks for the work that you're putting into uh, the hepatitis C portion and, and everything else as well. Okay, uh, moving on next on the agenda. So we have our managed care update. Uh, we have uh, Bobby Joe listed and also uh, Justin. So I'll turn it over to Bobby Joe and then you can uh, direct to Justin as you need. Thanks, Nick. This is Bobby Joe. I wanted to give you a couple, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of updates here related to the managed care contracts. And we are working on contract amendment number 14, and we should have out um, our amendments to our um, Division of Finance and, and Administrative Services, and then it will go on to OA 
Uh, we should have that out of MoHealthNet by the end of this week. So we hope to have that all good and, and being processed so that we can have it ready to go for July 1. The managed care plans are awaiting um, that information. And then additionally, I just wanted to provide an update on the RFP for 2023. Um, we have that mostly finalized and we are getting ready to move it through the internal approval process as well. We're a little bit behind on that. As you know, there's um, been a lot going on <laughs> the last few weeks, so um, we're having to wait and finalize some, some last minute um, discussions, but as soon as that is done, it should get on over to OA as well. Um, and then they'll start their work for reviewing it and ensuring that it's ready to get out on the street. We hope that it'll be out by August. Um, our original date was July, but as you know, um, like I said, it's it's been a little bit chaotic recently, so we do need to make sure we've got that all um, tightened up. Um, I don't have a ton of other updates, but I did want to let you know that I did put in the chat the website link to where anyone can go out to our public site and um, pull down our current contract amendments or even the current um, original contract from the last RFP from May of 2017. Um, the site that I provided is where you can see everything that has been approved up to this point by CMS, and you will also find um, the pending contract amendment, um, which CMS is still in the process of approving. And that is all I have, unless you have any questions for me, and uh, Justin is going to talk about our performance withhold for us. Okay, so uh, Bobby Joe, um, this is Nick Fannin still. Um, so that sure. link, would that would that um, give detailed information in regards to incentive programs and things like that to kind of answer or or go back on Representative McCreary's question, or is that going to be information coming up uh, with Justin? So um, Justin may talk a little bit about it as well, but it, within the contracts, the language there does talk to um, what the requirements are of what managed care plans need to provide related to member incentives and provider incentives. So you should find language there. However, I will tell you that some of the language is that they can submit for approval to MoHealthNet division different um, programs so that we can review them and approve them. Okay. Very and it good. might be different for each plan. Right. Uh, related to the performance withhold, though, there are incentives as far as improving the outcome measures related to HEDA, so that's where I'm going to let um, Justin touch base there. Okay, very good. Uh, any questions specifically for Bobby Joe before we move on to uh, performance withholds with Justin? Okay, uh, Justin, we'll turn it over. Go ahead. All right, just a quick check that everyone can hear me. Yes, I'm picking you up. All right, thanks. I'm Justin Clutter. I'm with the Transformation Office, uh, but previously I was in managed care as a quality oversight manager, and the performance withhold is something that's pretty near and dear to me. Uh, I've got this presentation broken up into three, three sections here, kind of to talk about a little bit about where we've been with the performance withhold. And then I'll, I'll talk about how COVID's kind of put a little bit of a damper into it and we transitioned uh, temporarily. And then lastly, I'll talk about where we're heading. Uh, first of all, where we've been, a couple of years ago, we developed, redeveloped our performance withhold. Uh, we were working with very homegrown measures. Uh, the data wasn't really very good. It wasn't driving the quality like we wanted it to. So we did collaborate with our health plans and came up with a new program. Uh, it consists of 14 HEDIS measures, uh, and we retain 3% of their per member per month capitation payment. And the first year that we did this in fiscal year 2020, that equated to about $49 million across all three health plans. Uh, the health plans were tasked with 
showing significant improvement on these 14 measures. Uh, a lot of them that we selected, we were in the, the very lowest percentile within the nation. Uh, so we had some overarching goals of getting to the 50th percentile, which is kind of where the national average hovers. Uh, of course, you can go into the 90th or 95th, which is, is great, but we are really striving to get at least to the 50th percentile. Uh, the payment methodology that we tied to these measures gave them ample opportunity to get there. Uh, primarily, we were looking for a two percentage point increase year over year. It, just in that first year, uh, we had dreams of, you know, upping that percentage as, as the program grew and they got, you know, their incentive programs built around this program and could really take it and make it their own and, and make those significant increases. Uh, there was also a, a trigger that if they got to the 50th percentile, which was our goal, uh, they could get the withhold. Uh, if they exceeded it, you know, enormously, you know, if they re went six percentage points, there was there was a trigger there that they could get more than a hundred percent of that particular measures payout. Uh, but keeping in mind that we never pay out more than that three percentage uh, of the withhold. Uh, we're not going to pay them 4% because we are only re withholding 3% of the withhold. Uh, next slide, please. So the growth that we saw in that first year, like I said, was tremendous. It, it surprised us. It surprised the health plans. Uh, you know, we weren't sure where we would land in that first year. Uh, now, keeping in mind that every HEDIS measure is unique, some are tied to, to children and well child visits. Uh, we have an annual, annual dental visit in there. Uh, we have chlamydia screenings, uh, prenatal and postpartum care. But on average, when we looked at these measures across all three health plans, we saw an average of 4.33 percentage point increases, which we were very pleased with in that first year. Next slide, please. And here are the 14 measures that we used in state fiscal 2020 and the average change that we saw over over the three health plans. Uh, you can see, you know, 6.9 percentage points. Uh, some of them did not get to that two percentage points. Uh, but as you can see, as a whole, there were significant gains on some of these. And if you'll advance one more, these, the Medication management for asthma, those were very low. Uh, however, our health plans all exceeded the 50th percentile on those. So we were happy to see that even though they didn't get that large gain uh, year over year. And with these two measures in particular, oh, I'm get, getting some echo. But these particular measures here, uh, the NCQA who sets the specifications for all of these measures, they did retire these, so they're no longer in our program uh, at this point anyways. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned, COVID-19 did have an impact on our performance withhold. As you can tell, if kids aren't going to regular well, child visits, uh, these measures are not going to increase uh, nationally. The NCQA does expect all of these measures to be lower uh, for calendar year 2020. Uh, so we had to pivot a little bit. Uh, what we did, we did get together with our health plans and develop, we didn't want to abandon the performance withhold. We thought there was still something that we could be gained uh, here, even if it wasn't, you know, specific uh, measures that we could compare nationally. So what we did is came up with three tasks. Uh, if we go to the next slide. The first task was asking each of the health plans to do a, a, a focus study on quality improvement and we let them choose the project. Uh, Mo Health Net did require them to submit the project plan to us and we would be the ones to approve it. Uh, and all of the health plans have done that. Uh, some of them are looking specifically at telehealth initiatives, uh, seeing how they can build their network uh, utilizing telehealth. Uh, others are looking at social determinants of health uh, using uh, digital health service providers. And 
we're really excited about this one because it does give them kind of a little bit of a breathing room. Uh, we're still paying for something that is very valuable, and we're hoping that this is something that we can gain some insight on. The health plans can do the same to see where they can, you know, target specific areas of their population and, and really improve that health care and quality. And next slide, please. Task two was continuing to have them submit the HEDIS measures, even though we expect them to be lower than the prior year, we still want to get that data. Uh, another piece to this that we required uh, as part of the, the COVID-19 version of the performance withhold is that we wanted that HEDIS data aggregated by county, race, and gender. Uh, Dr. Stubbe talked a little bit about this. Uh, the reason we want to do this is because you know, when we see those HEDIS measures drop, we, we want to be able to identify areas within our membership and, and participants of why. Uh, is it within a specific county that, that people just aren't going to, to the dentist? Uh, are specific races being in, have, have a harder time getting well child visits? Things like that. We, we're really excited about seeing this data. Um, we think it can help us identify some potential health, health disparities and target some improvements in value-based models down the road. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, task three was having them create an analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on their performance measures, utilization, and incentive programs. We thought this was important because, as everyone's aware, COVID kind of took us by surprise. Uh, we didn't really know how we could continue something like a performance withhold uh, because we didn't know how long it was going to last, uh, what kind of impact it would have on normal health care visits. So we, we tasked them with really digging in and seeing how COVID impacted what they do. Uh, and we're hoping that this analysis can help us identify some key elements on those effects and we can utilize that for future pandemics or disasters just so that we're more prepared and they are too. Next slide, please. Now, where we're going for fiscal year 2022, which is going to begin in July, uh, we're headed back to HEDIS measures. Uh, we feel like people are getting more and more comfortable going to the doctor, getting those routine visits, uh, getting the, the necessary care that they need, uh, getting more comfortable going to a public place and, and getting those services. Um, We've had to make some, slide, make some slide adjustments to the measures that we use because the NCQA has made some specification changes. They, they do that. That's normal. Uh, they'll change the age ranges, uh, segregate it out even more. For instance, the well child visits, I think there's four different age ranges now. Uh, so we, we included those in the, the withhold that we're going to implement in uh, July. Uh, another change that we'll see in the withhold is we've, we've done the 3% for a few years now. Due to the full Medicaid pricing now being included in the capitation payments, uh, we didn't previously withhold uh, for the performance withhold on those funds, but we are now. Uh, it's going to be reduced to 2.5%. Now, what that does, it still keeps the same dollar amount within the performance withhold. When we developed this model, uh, we envisioned it hovering around that 60 to $65 million range for that 3% withhold to, to keep that uh, incentiv incentivized uh, amount for the health plans to keep those quality measures in check. Uh, even lowering it to 2.5 keeps that same amount dollar amount tied to the withhold. So I, th I think we're still going to have, you know, significant improvement. They're still going to drive to to do those provider and member incentive programs to drive the quality. And I think uh, I may have one more slide. And some other adjustments that we we've made to the performance withhold is there's we we expect it to be a slow ramp up. Um, and before we required them to get to the 50th percentile in the, the quality compass, which is the NCQA uh, national standards, uh, it's all of the MCOs 
data throughout the nation. They report their HEDIS measures, and the NCQA builds a quality compass so we can compare, compare ourselves to other states. Um, we've lowered that to the 33rd percentile, which is kind of just the tier below the 50th. Uh, we think that we will will get there, uh, if not exceed it, on a lot of these measures. But this is kind of a little bit of uncharted territory on, for all states with a performance withhold right now. Um, we're not sure how much the rates are going to drop due to COVID. Um, so we are we're putting the model back in place. The requirements to get the withhold are a little bit lower, um, but we're hopeful that it's still going to be get us back on track. And then in the next fiscal year, we'll get back to upping those percentage increases, upping it back to the 50th percentile. So this is kind of just, you know, restarting the program, getting everybody back on track. And uh, it, it's something we're kind of excited about. Uh, the health plans are too. They like this program. Uh, CMS really likes our model. Uh, and that's kind of all I have for my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Uh, yeah, Justin, this is uh, Nick Bannon still. So I, I have a couple questions here. Uh, well, one for you and, and one for maybe Representative McCreary. But uh, for you on, on this last slide here, when you're talking about uh, dropping our threshold uh, for fiscal year 2022, is that is that consistent with what you would see or or have discussed or heard from other states or, or other states? Is everybody in general just kind of taking a a little step back here and, and realizing that there's going to be a maybe a steeper hill to climb? Yeah, that's a good question. And I've been fortunate enough the last several weeks to be working on an MAMD uh, group around performance withholds. And a lot of states are, are struggling to even get to this type of model. Uh, they haven't gotten their health plans on board with even getting a model like this going. So. Missouri's in a unique position that we're we're ahead of the game on a lot of other states on a performance withhold. Uh, some of them are just paying for reporting, uh, kind of like what we did during the COVID area. Uh, but yeah, they're they're all concerned that the, these rates are going to be significantly lower, and their health plans are scared that you know they're not even going to get any of the money. And we're required to to have an actual actuarially sound performance withhold where the funds are reasonably obtainable. And, and I think this gets us to that. Okay, very good. So my, my second question is, is more to Representative McCreary, because um, you asked the question earlier. I just want to make sure that you feel like you've gotten the answers or at least the uh, mechanism to answer your question uh, earlier regarding the uh, incentives, any incentives available to the managed care plans. Yeah, I feel like I my questions were addressed. I guess the other thing I was just thinking about through this this presentation regarding coming through COVID-19 and coming out of it is one of the elephants in the room for a lot of our providers is uh, lack of access to broadband in order to do telehealth. And I'm hoping that as we're collecting data moving forward, that that's one of the variables that we can take a look at because it doesn't matter, you know, how good our providers are and what, you know, what they have going on at their clinics um, or their practice if if the patients don't have the ability to connect on the other side. So, you know, I think that although that's not anything that this group is charged with, I think that's a, a critical part of um, being prepared for something like this in the future. Yeah, I think a point well taken. I mean, it, uh, speaking as a provider again, this Nick famous do I, I mean, that that is a that is a, a, a certain barrier that we all have to overcome every day. Um, so I think that's a point well taken. Well, I feel like our providers that I'm familiar with um, have had contact with patients, but there's, you know, you do a, a uh, diabetes screening or, you know, things like that. You just can't do that via telehealth. So, you know, um, I think we've got some, you know, a couple different moving parts on this. We don't want to lose contact with folks, um, but we also have to figure out a way to get them back in so we can start hitting some of these uh, testing goals.
Hey, Justin, this is Joe Curley. Um, I apologize if I miss this. That This 1% increase expectation for FY 2022, I assume the baseline is, is 2020. That is correct. Uh, the baseline is the 2020 HEDIS data, and then our performance year is 2021 calendar year. Okay. My second question is when the state is looking at how many metrics to tie to this performance uh, withhold, what is the determination whether it should be 5, 10, or 15? I'm asking that question because often these expectations trickle down to the provider level that are often uh, in value-based care agreements. Um, and obviously it's easier to focus on a limited number of metrics versus more metrics. So just trying to understand how you all determine how many metrics to track. Absolutely. That, that is a fine line. I, I'll, I'll admit uh, some states, you know, will have three. Uh, we've seen other states with as many as 20. Uh, that's something that we talk extensively with our health plans about. We do not want to overburden them uh, with this program. We want these to be meaningful measures that they can really drive. Uh, these are all areas that uh, are important to MoHealthNet, important to our program. Uh, they're equally important to our health plans. So that, that is something that we definitely monitor. Uh, we would like to get it around the 10, 10 ish measure area, uh, but the way the NCQA altered some of these measures, it, it kind of ballooned a little bit this year. So we're seeing we'll have 15 measures this year. Uh, we have had conversations, I believe Kirk's even had conversations with health plans that they're comfortable where we're at right now, uh, but it is something that we, you know, do, we're mindful of at all times. Joe, this Thanks. is Kirk Matthews. I, this is a conversation Justin and I have been having. I too would like to see those measures shrink a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure if I would go as low as three or four or five, but uh, Justin mentioned 10 as something that we might be targeting in the future, but I share your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. I, I would just reiterate, it is a shared burden. It's not just a burden on the FCOs. It's a burden on the primary care providers uh, to help them attain those HEDIS metrics. And so are these metrics, are they focused on, is it a mix of quality improvement, but also uh, efforts that will actually lead to savings within the Medicaid program? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. You're that is a good question. A lot of them are getting, uh, a lot of them historically been around children and pregnant women. So ultimately, you know, the prenatal postpartum visits, uh, that keeps us out of the NICU. Uh, those very low birth weight babies are, are expensive to the program. Uh, you know, th those have long lasting impacts on the child. Uh, same with well child visits. You know, getting those kids in for those well child visits helps establish a healthy life uh, through their adulthood. Uh, you'll see immunizations for adolescents on their annual dental visits. So we do feel like these are all things, you know, chronic disease management uh, do impact the health and well-being of our, of our participants and essentially do lower costs in the long run. Yeah, Joe, this is Kirk again. I, Justin said it very well. It begins with quality, but the downstream benefit of quality is it costs less to care for healthier populations. And so that's really, that's really a, the dual benefit of these kind of measures. Sure. And I, my final thought, no, I appreciate that. It's, you know, I'm just more convinced that we need to incentivize the MCOs to actively engage in social determinants as well. Um, you know, somebody told me 20 or a long time ago that why would we take care of individuals within the four walls of a clinic and then send them back to the conditions that got them sick or kept them sick? And 
we also know that all those determinants impact overall cost and quality of life. So if there's any way in this upcoming RFP to really look at efforts to incentivize the plans to work with local partners uh, to actively engage around social determinants, I think well, that, that at the end of the day will result in better HEDIS outcomes and cost savings. And, and this is Gerard, I'll add to that uh, an imperative to make sure that those providers who uh, care for a disproportionate share of patients affected by structural racism that, uh, that results in social determinants of health, whether oral, whether rural or urban, and some of it's socioeconomic also, uh, that needs to be factored in also if possible. This is Kirk again. Um, we are, the, all three plans are working in social determinant arenas and maybe uh, at a future meeting, if uh, Chairman Fan Steele, if you would like, we might be able to uh, give a presentation or have some presentation made about what the plans are doing in social determinants. Um, right now, we are so close to issuing the RFP that we're uh, practically, if not actually, in a quiet period. So as far as what goes into the RFP, uh, our conversation is, is really quite limited right now. I, hope, uh, I apologize for that, but that's kind of where we are. Yeah, so this is Nick Bannister. I think in hearing and listening to the, the conversation going back and forth, um, I mean, I, I it seems like there is a, a vested interest here in in this topic moving forward. So, uh, Gail, I would I would ask that you make a note of it so that way um, when we meet to discuss the agenda uh, for the next upcoming meeting, we can discuss this and see if that's something that we uh, can put together as as a as a agenda item. That that would be great, Mr. Chairman. We will definitely do that. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for uh, Justin? Okay, I, I don't hear any and I don't see any in the chat. So Justin, thank you for the information. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, presenting it to us today. Okay, uh, Caitlin, I have you up next for a legislative update. So Caitlin, if you're there, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. This is Caitlin. Um, I will I will be somewhat brief because we've already talked on kind of the biggest legislative issue for this year, which is um, the FRA. So we'll all be eagerly watching how that moves forward. The other item I did just want to highlight is that um, the General Assembly did pass um, a statewide PDMP this year, which has been um, a mission for a number of years now. Um, that is that is beneficial for Medicaid. Uh, and so we will be watching as that is implemented over the next year or two. Um, and then obviously the, the governor hasn't taken action on many pieces of legislation. So we'll be uh, keeping an eye on what uh, legislation is signed and be assessing impacts on MoHealthNet as, as action is taken. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Caitlin, this is Nick Fannin still. Um, on the PDMP, in the in the language that was passed, is there a is there a deadline date or is there an implementation date on that specifically? There is, I believe, it's not until 2023, though, um, if I'm remembering correctly. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions uh, for Caitlin? Okay, thank you, Caitlin, for the brief but effective update. Thank you. Jesus. Uh, so, Tony is is Tony on the chat? I know we're running we're running a little bit ahead of schedule right now, but uh, Tony, if you're on the chat or on the on the meeting, then uh, we have you up next for a budget update. Uh, I certainly am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Okay, uh, just kind of 
want to quickly review uh, the changes that have occurred since uh, the last time we met, uh, I believe back in February. Uh, at that time, I had run through the uh, governor's recommended budget, and uh, so these slides really kind of compare uh, the changes since, uh, since that governor's recommended budget uh, back in February. Um, to date, uh, the governor has signed the supplemental. Um, the supplemental was uh, reduced by $59.3 million on the state share side, uh, mainly related to updated projections uh, around uh, managed care and pharmacy items. Um, next slide. Uh, we are still awaiting uh, governor's signature on, on the FY22 budget but uh, the items that the Gen General Assembly put forth uh, compared to the governor's recommended budget uh, uh, represent the following. Uh, we, we did have a hundred million dollars in state share funds uh, reduced from our cost to continue. Some of that was, uh, was related to the updated projections that I mentioned in the supplemental. Uh, another, uh, I believe, 49 million uh, was reduced uh, on the managed care line uh, uh, likely set aside for uh, supplemental next year. Um, the second item, the managed care actuarial request, was uh, reduced by $109.8 million total funds due to lower acuity needs uh, in FY22. Um, and the pharmacy specialty increase uh, was funded at half the governor's recommended amount. Uh, and Medicaid expansion funding uh, was not recommended by the General Assembly. Next slide. Uh, new items that were added in uh, by the General Assembly include uh, a $5 million state share uh, pickup for uh, pharmacy dispensing fees uh, related to uh, changes in the actual acquisition cost methodologies. We had a million dollar state share uh, uh, item to begin work for adding non-duals to the MoRx program and uh, $743,000 for a rate increase for autism services that are kind of housed in our physician related services section. And then in addition, uh, $95 million in a uh, rate increase for, uh, for skilled nursing facilities and for hospice, um, and this would be a one-time rate increase um, kind of associated with uh, uh, disaster relief uh, for, for those facilities. Next slide, please. Other new items include uh, $2.9 million for Family Certified Home Health Aid Pilot Program, $3 million in state share for a rate increase for um, air ambulance services, $5 million for COVID-19 testing uh, related to EMS provider work, and then uh, $2 million for FQHC community health workers for work with foster care children, and another uh, $50 million state-only share for uh, payments to hospitals uh, to offset uh, uh, transformation related efforts. And I believe. Hey, Tony, I'm going to jump in here. There's a question yes. uh, asking if you can go back to the previous slide. Sure can. Thank you. Um, we had a question about the 95 million state share for a $10 and 18 cent per day increase for skilled nursing facilities. And you said that was, is that, is that a one time only, or is that in perpetuity? Is that just for the, till that money runs out? Uh, that, that is a one year annual amount, uh, one time. And it says state share on there. I apologize. It's total uh, dollars. And it's related to uh, both uh, the skilled nursing facilities and uh, the associated 95% of uh, the skilled nursing facility rate increase for uh, that, that's related to hospice. Yes. All right. So th the reason it's it's just so after a year's period of time, or when this money runs out, it will go back to the previous or to the existing per day rate. Uh, that is the idea. It is a one-time increase. 
just be due to COVID and because these, these dollars are coming in. Is that my understanding? That, that that's, that's the right? understanding that, that, that we have as well from, from language provided. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. Sure. Senator Shoup, this is Kirk Matthews. Um, we are, uh, as, as, as one of the transformation initiatives, we have been working on rebasing the rates for our nursing homes. Um, we've been engaging the, uh, our, both our actuary and the nursing home associations in conversations about what that might look like. Uh, so that, that would probably be, uh, if all stays on target, might go live and, and there's appropriations for it next year, we go live next July. Okay, Tony, back to you. I, I didn't catch if you were at the end of your slides and presentation. I, I believe so. Uh, Gail, is is there another slide after that? Or Okay, yes, I am. <laughs> okay, then uh, we'll open it up here. Any other questions for Tony? Okay, well, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, next item on the agenda is always open for public comment. Uh, I do not see any uh, suggestions or comments in the chat box. Uh, Gail, just checking with you, uh, you have not received anything prior to the meeting or, or during the meeting, correct? No, I have not received anything. Okay, for anyone that's still in the meeting or on the, on the uh, phone, um, I'll give a, a few seconds here to see if there is any suggestions for public comment. Okay, <coughs> hearing none, uh, we'll move on to Kim. Kim, if you're still uh, on the meeting, we'll turn it over to you for your FSD update. I am, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank um, you. The first, the slides that you see um, are representing the, the numbers that we have of the participants um, as of April 2021. Um, we're showing in the managed care enrollment uh, that we have 793,871. Um, you know, as everyone knows, we're still in the public health emergency, which limits the um, the number of closures that we can do. There's, uh, you know, we could close for out of state um, deceased or if the individual requests for a closure. So as you go through these slides, you will see that, um, you know, our numbers will, will remain high. Um, and we will be in this through the public health emergency. So we are not doing the annual renewals. However, we are uh, accepting any information that the participant uh, reports to us and entering that information in the system. So when the time comes, then we'll be able to uh, level set the, the uh, cases and to move forward. So um, as you go to the next slide, um, this is our pending Medicaid applications. As you can see, uh, you know, we're staying real consistent. We are still in an open enrollment period. Uh, there was a new open enrollment for the uh, marketplace that opened in January. It is now going through August the 15th. We are not seeing a large increase in applications, but as we expect, as we move closer to, to July and August when kids start to re-enroll in schools, um, that we we have a normal bump then, so we we'll see where uh, see where that takes us. But like I said, uh, you know, we, the churn doesn't happen when we're not doing uh, annual renewals and folks are not closing their coverage. Uh, so we're just not seeing that normal churn that we have. And then the next slide then um, shows the Medicaid caseload that we have, and um, you know. Without, uh, like I said, with being under the public health emergency, uh, then we are keeping folks on the coverage. Uh, just to give you a really quick update um, on where we are with Family Support Division, um, we have had our resource centers opened um, to the public since February the 22nd by appointment only. Um, we did not open the metros at that time for the St. Louis, Kansas City, and, and Springfield, but we did, uh, our rural areas were open, um, and we were also, still have the call center and everything available. Uh, 
we have now, we have our doors open um, and, and we are uh, still taking appointments. Uh, they can, uh, there is a 800 number that individuals can call and uh, request an, uh, an appointment with the resource centers or they can go online and request that. But the great thing that we found out is we return a call to these individuals when they want to um, have an appointment and we're able to resolve most of their issues without them having to come to the office. So uh, it's really great to know that we're being able to serve the participants, um, you know, without them having to get out. Some are still a little bit concerned about getting out. There's still uh, transportation issues. And this is something that we want to continue because I feel like it's a good service that we can, um, you know, we can provide to citizens who do have uh, mobility issues or it's just that, you know, the transportation's not available or they're not comfortable with getting um, out in the public yet. Uh, we are seeing an increase in our, uh, our foot traffic, which is really good because uh, folks are getting uh, back to uh, normal to, to come in and see us. We are still not in a full rhythm with our SNAP program yet, um, and, and we will be transitioning into that where we will be doing um, the interviews for the um, recertifications of, of the SNAP program. And so that will happen um, in, in later in the summer, but we will, we will expect to see uh, some more traffic come in at that point. Um, we are uh, excited today that uh, we have started a new tasking system uh, with the income maintenance program, which is going to allow us to, uh, as we roll out of the public health emergency, uh, direct the flow of work. So we're, we're going to be able to uh, be able to control the work a little bit more and get, get the work uh, to, to the staff easier. And we're going to be able to tell, uh, you know, what work is being done and where are our hot spots and where do we need to concentrate moving staff to, uh, to do the work. So really excited about that project today. I haven't had any emails saying everything's blowing, blowing up, so I think we're good for today. Um, you know, as Kurt uh, presented to you, we've been working very hard on this multi-benefit streamlined application. We are now in the steps of waiting for all of our federal partners to review this. So there's a 90-day process to that. Uh, so our SNAP federal partners, our temporary assistance and child care partners, and then also with, with CMS for Medicaid, will have to agree to, to this application. So we'll, we'll, we're getting that in front of them. Um, I appreciate all of the help that we've received from our stakeholders. Uh, we've had uh, folks from, that represented the FQHC, some of our um, hospital partners and legal aid have taken a look and given their, um, given us their opinions of this and we've been working through this and I just really appreciate their help on this project. And as Kurt talked about, we've now moved on to reviewing our notices and uh, we're asking this same group to help us. We also engage uh, our participants and uh, Sevilla has really helped us with doing that customer experience of uh, getting their opinion on, you know, what, it, what is the barriers and difficulties for them? And then what is, uh, once we get a final product, how does this, uh, does this help them? Is it something that they feel that is um, a more workable solution? So it's, it's been really, uh, really a good thing to watch this project in, going forward. And then uh, Kurt also uh, talked about the Medicaid-only application. So we will be uh, promoting that. And um, what we will be doing is obsoleting the um, adult Medicaid application and they will, um, everyone will apply on this one Medicaid application that really streamlines things for us, um, streamlines things for the participants because they, they don't have to go out and uh, try to find all the different applications they know if they want Medicaid. You apply with this one application, and then um, you know that gets it into for us to process. Um, I oh, and I need to address the gateway um, that was renewed January uh, of 2018 for a five year um, five years, and that will end on December of 2022. Did that answer the question? Yes, uh, a quick follow up. If um, the Medicaid expansion constitutional amendment is implemented, how does that affect the gateway waiver? So we'll be doing reviews on the uh, gateway participants. 
uh, to look to see how they, uh, to, for their eligibility for that new program. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let me. Uh, you got a you got a couple questions. This is Nick Fansdale. Uh You got a couple questions <laughs> in the chat box here. Um, Jamie Rodriguez wants to know if if the offices Medicaid offices are available for walk in visits or if it's still appointment only. No, they we are open for walk in, and then they also individual can make an appointment um, if they feel more comfortable doing that. So we are we have all of the resource centers open. It's not what you said earlier. We've transitioned our staff back. It was very, it was a large effort to, um, you know, transition our, our staff home. And then uh, now we have transitioned them back. But it, it's, it's been um, interesting to see uh, that we can establish a mobile workforce that now gives us some ideas of how that we could be more mobile. Uh, and looking at things where maybe we can handle, uh, you know, we're getting us prepared for like natural disasters or, or other issues where we have to send folks home um, and, or, or, you know, have to move them across the state to do work. So it's, it's, it's really opened up some interesting ideas to think about. Okay, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Senator Shoup. Uh, she's typed in a couple questions here, so I'll, I'll let her uh, address both of those so I'm not uh, misinterpreting anything. Okay, let me just, um, so if the court rules in favor of the plaintiffs in uh, this lawsuit that was just filed, how quickly would the state be able to implement the Medicaid expansion program? Uh, and by implement, I'm talking about all the different pieces like from taking applications to providing the service, uh, those kinds of pieces. Yeah, yeah. Senator Shoup, this is, this is Kirk again, and I apologize, but we we just can't we can't comment on anything okay. to do with that at this point. Uh, if that happens, we'll we'll address it at that point. Okay. Um, I mean, but I'm assuming before session ended that the plan was to put this into place July 1st, uh, or to start taking applications right away, beginning July 1st. So. Um, I, I do not want to put you in a position of saying anything that you can't say, but my sense is that the pieces are there to have done that starting July 1st. Is Senator that, Shoup, I, I, pre I appreciate your question. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm I, trying I to be a good lawyer. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not a lawyer, as is likely obvious. All right, let me ask my second question. Okay, um, go ahead. <laughs> my, thank you. My second question is about the application itself, and I think it's great that it's been streamlined and that it will cross you know, for people who are receiving different kinds of, of state help, state benefits um, from TANF to SNAP to, um, to healthcare. Um, I read through just part of it when we got it yesterday and it's still kind of complicated and um, I, I'm not sure if this is considered to be the final form. I wanted to know if it is, because I think that there are a couple of things that I could talk to somebody about offline, but also, um, has it been tested with actual Medicaid recipients or people who receive some of the other services to see how they do with it and to get their input on what might make it more user friendly? I'll let, I'll been, let, oh, Kim, go ahead, Kirk. Yeah, oh, we, well, I was going to say, I'll let Kim answer that last part. Well, I'll let Kim answer it, but the, the bottom line answer is yes, uh, Sevilla conducted tons of interviews with participants with the with the revised application and and got their input but Kim you go ahead you can probably t talk about it a lot more than I can we we have tested it with recipients uh, and uh, sitting there with our workers Sevilla was there uh, you know we, we took live applications using this new format uh, we took very specific areas and worked with the staff with uh, <laughs> participants as we were going through that and they were, um, you know, taking the surveys on how did participants uh, like the application? Was it, were there any barriers that they found? And then, you know, also working with staff to see, did this increase our work or was it very easy for us to flow through with the information? And so uh, this is the product that, that they came up with. 
But I'd, I'd be very interested. I'd be very interested to to hear your opinion on uh, some of the difficult difficult areas around the application. Sure. I would be. I would be. Uh, I would love to be able to talk with you about that. Maybe we could do that offline, and I can um, provide some of my. And I haven't. Uh, truth be told, I haven't read all the way through it yet. Uh, but what I started reading yesterday, um, you know, I, I I thought that there were some. Uh, concerns and some barriers. So maybe we could set up a phone call after the meeting and run through it. At, um, I'll be on the road tomorrow, so maybe we can talk then. That that sounds great. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, I believe that's all I have for FSD. Okay, uh, Kim, this is Nick Bannon still. So I, I do have a question for you. Um, if you have any guidance on this, um, we, we, you spoke to the fact that there are no renewals happening at this time because of the public health emergency um, status that we are in. Uh, I'm wondering uh, when that when that is no longer in place and the renewals um, come into effect again. Is there thought? Has there been thought given to how that is going to roll out? I mean, do you foresee that being a um, a drastic drop all at once? for rolling off people, or is it going to be this rolling uh, cycle where there's going to be a certain number of people each month that go off? And that is exactly what we're looking at right now. One of the first steps we're going to have to do is we're, you know, I talked about we were taking the changes and entering those into the system. We'll have to level set the system first because some individuals may have made reports that constituted an annual renewal, so, so they'll be able to just move forward. Um, we will hit the normal cycle of annual renewals. So every month we will we will start hitting the annual renewals. You know, we pull 55 days prior to the date of their um, annual renewal. So we will start with the first group whenever the health emergency, um, you know, ends. We'll we'll look at the the month that is due for an annual renewal, and we'll just start doing the annual renewals that way. Okay. Okay. Very good. Are there any other questions for uh, Kim? Okay, uh, hearing none, then we are we have made it uh, through the agenda. I again, I appreciate everybody's time and and willingness to get onto the call today. Um, we do have a couple minutes, so um, in in case there's any pressing questions that. Uh, I don't see in the chat or that anyone else has. I'll, I'll wait just a second here to see. If not, then I'll, I will entertain a motion to uh, adjourn the meeting. So moved, this is Gerard. Okay, so I have a first from Gerard, a, a second for adjournment. Rob Nodell, second. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a first and a second for adjournment. Uh, any last questions or concerns? Hearing none, all, all members in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Hearing none, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.